Good evening. This is Clifford Brooks, founder of the Southern Collective Experience and author of the books The Draw Broken Eyes and Whirling Metaphysics, Athena Departs, and Whirling Metaphysics. Today on Dante's Old South, heard here on WUTC and NPR, we'll be discussing the Southern Collective Experience from the different viewpoints of those involved within and outside of the SCE. We'll also be doing time discussing the magazine that the Southern Collective Experience puts out seasonally called the Blue Mountain Review. We hope that you enjoy each and every one of those that we bring up and the readings that they bring with them. We'll be having music throughout the program to break the chit chat and give your mind a little time to sit back and hum along. I have a new book coming out through Backlash Press out of the UK um, called Athena Departs, Gospel of a Man Apart. That will be available through all major booksellers and on my tour starting at the end of May 2017. And to end my opening statements to you tonight, I will read the poem from Athena Departs, Gospel of a Man Apart, called Blues Round Midnight. Robert Johnson jacked up my love of brown liquor. The affection affixes me to the sprawling agony of furies. But there ain't no blues Beelzebub can bounce off me that the right woman can't wave away. Numb. Night terrors have me harangued and haunted. Gums receding, mentally rickety, the collection of losing girlfriends to Christ doesn't develop into a malady of doubt. He can have them. Most of them are married with kids by now. I never adopt another's anxiety. When guilt gets in my guts, I gotta get going. Little old ladies are precious in pews, praying for me. The music never changes. It's a tender language. They are a prayer list. Such a small, quiet room where people think of the dead and sniffle. Held down hard by heavy breaths, I insist. My grief is the sprawling stab of what pain is. The day after, vodka sucked from a plastic bottle. Amore and addiction, their taste is exactly the same. I sew them up in a burlap sack and then sink it in the Oconee. I reflect on all the reasons life refused to let me go. There were three winters where my resolve failed like Hector. An antidote was absent. I was absent. In the ache of being no one, a fusion of confusion, and my ego left a contusion still seen on my face. I have foregone trying to find its cause, and it remains elusive. Still, I, I still stay up, awake but unaware beyond the burden my mind can bear. Every day, I decide to ignore my rusty pipes and deem the migraines divine. In time, my qualms with worry will be seeds of an escape, saying to Etta James, don't explain. And before we bring in our first guest, Scott Thomas Outler, we will hear nostalgia from the Orange Walls. Shaking like a leaf because I know you're home. Got a new place in Mexico and it's better. You slept all day and put it up yourself just to spend the night with someone else and now I'm bitter. And I know you say you're sorry. Yeah, you're sorry, that's damn right. You had me staring at the bottom of a bottle all that night. I washed your smell away with whiskey I couldn't get you off my mind I couldn't get that gone But did you hold your friend 
this girl, you know you drive me crazy Nostalgia's not as good as it once was Put us to write you down as a baby And some will later on I might love you But don't be thinking you're gonna save me And now on Don Cesar South, we have Georgia native Scott Thomas Outler. How are you doing this evening, brother? Doing just fine, Cliff. Thank you. Man, tell us about your experiences in the Southern Collective experience and um, what it's come to mean to you. Well, since joining the collective a couple of years ago, the best experiences I've had are being on shows such as this with WUTC and some of the other events that we do, the Visions of Verse, uh, Open Mic in Pickens County. And we do a new collective sessions at Good Acting Studio in Marietta, Georgia. And so getting to experience all those people coming together and hear all the tremendous voices uh, from different types of styles, music and poetry, it's really heightened my own sense of creativity in a number of ways. And just seeing all the different types of artists that we have in our group really 
forces you to take your game to a new level. So I think that's the greatest benefit so far. Man, outstanding. And as far as the Blue Mountain Review, our magazine, um, tell us a little bit about your involvement in that. With the Blue Mountain Review, um, contributing an editor there. So I'll have an essay or some poems in there occasionally. And then also try to take on as many interviews as possible with each issue, uh, which has also been another challenge. Uh, learning how to ask the right type of questions with folks and get them headed in the direction that they want to be. Um, it's a process that I've really started to enjoy. And in this upcoming spring issue, hopefully have uh, Alan Britt and William S. Tribble that I'm doing some interviews with. Fantastic, man. What other magazines are you involved in and what are you doing for them? Uh, I'm also the editor at an online venue called The Peregrine Muse, which is a uh, international site. We have a lot of eclectic writers there. I'm a contributing editor at a site called Novel Masters, where I do interviews. And then also another site that is under the umbrella of the collective organization is called Walking is Still Honest Press. And I, along with Holly Holt, are the two editors there. And we're always taking submissions year-round, so anyone can look us up and send us some work. We'd be more than happy to look at it. Brother Outlook, all of this leads up to what we need to know, and that is where your literary career is right now, what you've got out, and how we can put our hands on it. Well, right now, um, still trying to promote my latest book, which is called Happy Hour Hallelujah. came out last summer through CTU Publishing out of California. And it's got a lot of my spiritual work, more nature-centered, uh, as opposed to some of my earlier collections. And it can be found on Amazon or directly through the CTU Publishing website, their store there. And I have another manuscript I'm working on at the moment called Poison in Paradise, which just got picked up. So hoping to have that out if not by the end of 2017, then early 2018. And where can we go to hear you read, man? The upcoming event at the end of April in Marietta, Georgia. I'll be there. I also have a YouTube channel where I read poetry. I uh, just launched that recently, so I'm having a bit of fun there. Southern Collective Experience, we have our YouTube channel through them as well. Um, some of our readings are up on there. So the first time to see you will be on the 29th from 7 to 9 at Good Acting Studios in Marietta, Georgia? That's going to be it, and it's going to be a good time. We hope to see a lot of people there. Fantastic. And let's whet their appetite with some pieces of your work, brother. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read a few pieces from the upcoming collection I mentioned. This first one is called Something Sacred in Our Sadness. If I write one more time about the sky and how it's set to fall at any moment? How many chances will I have left when the rain finally does begin to pour? If I dance alone on a bridge in the middle of the woods, is that the same as on a stage somewhere, someday, somehow? All you ever needed was to bless us. All I want to do is laugh and smile. Yet when we weep, please let it be in joy even though we know this sadness heals through love. They said this carpet knew how to fly when guided proper, but forgot to mention that the engine could sometimes stall. And what we've learned passed down throughout the ages is that the magic comes from our minds when we truly decide to soar. This next piece is one that'll be coming out soon through a uh, broadside series put out through 48th Street Press. It's going to be a limited edition signed and numbered, so looking forward to that in July. And it's called Midnight Wonder. Head in the clouds, soul on the brink of salvation and or annihilation at any moment. The signs in the sky appear to point out our future in space. The signs in my mind seek to find the path home to source. But the signs on the street are marketed for entirely different ends, singing their songs about realtors who have erected new neighborhoods as far as the eye can see in this suburban wonderland. 
chopping down trees, chasing deer from their home. Come meet me at midnight, my friend. We'll stare straight into heaven's void together, for I too know what it is to roam. And then one final piece from the upcoming manuscript. It's called, It Doesn't Matter Where, It Only Matters Who. Let's hit the road and head west for a while, or turn the compass due north and set sail for the Great Lakes. Let's wake up each morning, slowly, and talk about our dreams before conquering the day. Let's catch a plane to Egypt, land somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and start walking through the desert, guided by the siren call of the Sphinx. Let's write a romance novel with our actions in real time, bringing all the words we haven't even imagined yet to life. Let's take a trip to the luscious jungle and set up shop in the trees, or catch a cruise to Italy and lounge in the shade by the sea. Let's sit and feast for five hours straight while I drink deeply from your lovely eyes, and then stroll through the park hand in hand, chatting about this and that until we've solved every subject under the sun. Let's burn so bright our hearts can't help but remain aflame forever. Let's laugh so much we begin to make music with our smiles together. Scott Thomas Adler, I cannot thank you enough, man. And um, I can't wait to come back next time with you. All right, I appreciate it, Cliff. Thanks for having me again, and thanks to WUTC and NPR. It's been great. All right, man. And as we move on to novelist Shane Etter, we will play Light Coming Through by Wyatt Espelin. again with novelist Shane Etter, and he is one of the newest members of the Southern Collector Experience. How you doing, man? I am thrilled to be here. Thank you. It is a pleasure to have you here, and I'm almost jumping out of my seat. I'm so giddy to have this story told again, like a kid wanting to hear about Santa, but man, <laughs> tell me how you got into writing again. It's a little extreme. I don't recommend it for most people. For the first 56 years of my life, I was the least creative man 
probably on the planet. But at 50 years old, I had a, a massive stroke. And uh, as I like to say, I was Dane Bramaged. And uh, <laughs> at six, years, six years after uh, my stroke, I was going, my brain was going through some changes. And I went to bed normal one night, the least creative guy walking the planet. And when I woke up the next morning, my brain had become rewired. I had become creative overnight and started working on my first novel that morning. Hallelujah. I beg your pardon? I said hallelujah. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> like I say, it's a little extreme. I don't, don't try this at home, listeners, <laughs> having a stroke to become creative, but uh, it worked for me. Fantastic, man. And tell us about some of the books that you have out now, two of which have been coming out now less than a month apart. Tell us about that, man. Yeah. The most recent one, about, like you say, less than a month ago, is called A Brain in Third Person, and it's about a serial killer who become, in, in Atlanta who becomes a serial killer due to brain change. And you can guess, based on my previous story, that it's loosely, very loosely, because I haven't murdered anybody. I'm not a serial killer, but it is loosely bra- bla- excuse me, based on my own personality change uh, from one extreme to another. I decided to take it just where could I start with this guy, the opposite of a serial killer. And he's the, mo- the meekest, most mildest human being you'd ever meet in your life, prim and proper and preppy. And how could a brain injury change him? And overnight, he becomes a meat-eating, weight-lifting, long-haired, foul-mouthed, tattooed serial killer. So, Just like home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just this, this prolific nature you have, and, and you're, you're a very gregarious, easy-to-talk-to person. Um, all of these features, all of these fantastic personality traits, um, we're so blessed to have that as a part of the Southern Collective Experience. What is being a member of the collective and, and, and what you hope to see out of it? What are some of those things that you have inside you? Cliff, what I am excited about mostly is giving a platform or a voice to writers that are writers but undiscovered yet authors, let's say, mm-hmm. and to try and put a fine line on the difference. Mm-hmm. They are writers, definitely, but they are unpublished at this point or maybe not to the platform that we have with the Southern Collective Experience, and I'm excited about giving these authors, some who are young, some who are not, uh, a platform that they've never had before and seeing what they can do. You know, as you know, in the Deep South here, we have a delicious history of color and dynamicism that I just think is uh, needs to be brought out, and I think that's what we're going to do with the uh, Blue Mountain Review. Amen, man. And with the Blue Mountain Review, you led me right to it, man. What's it like being the prose editor? I mean, what, what do you look for? What's been some of the pleasant surprises? I, although I don't write Southern fiction, I do like Southern fiction. And uh, I, like, I like weird stuff, as you right. can tell, since I write about serial killers and gangs in New York and things like that. But uh, like I say, there are some voices out there that just do some amazing things. We... A friend who is in coming out in the the spring edition that's due out soon, Roy Richardson. He is a he's a former comic inker and writer. Has worked on some very well known comic strips, and he's turned to fiction now. And his his prose will make you laugh so hard you'll cry. Right. So I'm I'm thrilled about giving people like that a voice and a platform. Well, fantastic. And then again, you mentioned before about um, the work on gangs. You're going to read some of that from for us today, aren't you? I'm going to read from A War in the Bronx is the name of my newest novel. It will hit the shelves a week from Monday, May 1st. All right. And, uh, this, is just, this is just a, I think, a colorful little scene. One of my uh, detectives in uh, the Bronx is going to uh, his favorite diner for dinner after work and before he goes to his law school class. So that's all the uh, background information I think you need to know. But with its strong smell of grease and coffee, the diner had the ability to turn the stomach of someone with a weak constitution, but it was nearly full of people with strong stomachs or weak noses. Men and women wearing the New York City uniform of dark colors, black or navy blue, jackets and outerwear, except for one elderly lady already in the holiday spirit wearing a well-worn many seasons old Christmas sweater of green and red that smelled of mothballs. In contrast to the other diner's dark dark shades, her brightly colored sweater and silver hair lightened up the room. 
The warm resonance of friendly conversation above the sound of flatware clattering was welcoming. What do you have, baby? The middle-aged server with copper-colored dyed hair said in her bourbon lace smoker's voice from behind the stainless steel counter. She obviously wasn't eating the diner's food. She was five foot six and weighed no more than 100, 110 pounds. Johnny'd been seeing her at Starshine for two-thirds of a decade, and she still called him baby, never once asking his name. That's just the way New Yorkers were. She wore a light blue mid-20th century waitress uniform, her black name tag, Red Blanche. He didn't bother looking at the menu she placed before him. It hadn't changed in six years, and he always ordered the same meal. The silverware was placed neatly on a folded white cloth napkin. Meatloaf, mashed potatoes, green beans, coffee regular. In New York City vernacular, regular meant with cream and sugar. Fewer words to say because everyone was in a hurry, even if they weren't. Using a pencil retrieved from where it pierced the thick layers of her copper-colored hair, Blanche wrote the order down on an old-school ticket pad. Be right out, she said, as she clipped the light green-colored paper ticket on a clothespin hanging from a wire in the window open open to the kitchen. Order up, she shouted, so the cook could hear it above the den her voice larger than her small size. He shook his head slightly at her, feeling she needed to yell. She poured, coffee, she poured the coffee from a silver carafe into a, <clears throat> excuse me, into a heavy-sided white mug and set it down too hard, splashing some on the counter in front of him. Oops, in, f- in place of an apology and a tilt of her head in embarrassment, she found a dirty white hand towel and began to wipe up the spill. She hummed an unrecognizable tune while she cleaned the mess. Johnny's cell phone lying on the counter rang its, vib- rang its vibration causing the surface to re- reverberate like a buzzing bee. New Jersey native Bruce Springsteen's born to run its ringtone. He saw his wife's initials MC, the nickname he used for his wife, Mary Catherine. Hey, babe, yell, left on time. I'm at Starshine. Getting a bite before class. Be home soon as it's over. About 11. Love you too. I will. Bye. Server topped off his coffee, altering the perfect blend of cream and sugar she'd concocted. Noticing a small jar with perforations in the lid and containing cinnamon sitting on the counter, he sifted some into his coffee, giving it a Christmassy taste. John hoped it wasn't an indication the diner was trying to turn into a yuppie establishment. He wasn't a fan of gentrification, hoping that the Bronx would never change. The restaurant held a dozen other patrons, working class like him, mostly from the South Bronx neighborhoods, still living where they'd grown up in the shadows of the George Washington Bridge and inside of the New Jersey Palisades. Although they didn't feel like they were trapped, most would never leave. Brilliant work, man. Brilliant work. Well, thank you. Truly. And again, this is Shane Etter, prose editor for the Blue Mountain Review, which is a part of the Southern Collective Experience, of which Shane is a brother. And please look him up on Facebook and on our website, www.southerncollectiveexperience.com, to find out more about him and where you can hear him read. Thank you so much for coming in, Shane. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. All right. And before we bring in Hani, we would start with with another song by Wyatt Esplin called The Burden. Back the burden bin All of the treasure That I locked inside a tin All that I spoke With the tongue of a serpent Will you take it all Say you'll take it all right now Can't find 
find us sitting with Mrs. Honey's Weibel. How are you doing this evening? Doing great. A long time sister in the Southern Collective Experience. How has it been being a member of this club? Awesome. Where do you think the direction is going and um, how do you want to play a part in that? Well, I think we're finally starting to solidify who we are and what we're about. And I just see it going forward from here. All good stuff. I feel the same. And again, you have played a pivotal role in this, this cement that's held us together within the last 12 months. And one of the biggest ways you've helped, not just with the Southern Collective Experience, but with our magazine, the Blue Mountain Review, is being a poetry editor. What's it like being on the other side of the glass, so to speak, as the poetry editor and not just one submitting? You know, it's really awesome to wake up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, go into my email and see people from all over the world have sent me poetry. I've had people from Iraq and Mauritius, people from Ireland, Canada. So it's really amazing to see all these different voices from everywhere. And I love being a part of that poetry still being alive and active and not just old dead dudes. So. <laughs> and you can't ask for more than that. You've got some recent publications and, uh, and things written that are kind of outside of poetry. What's going on with that? Where are we going to find it? Um, I had a small piece in Sage Woman magazine. Um, it's their fairy issue just came out. And then I had some pieces recently in Wish magazine, which is another of our publications. And those were poetry. But I think all of my writing has very poetic elements. So that piece that was in Sage Woman is very, it started as a poem, actually. And she wanted me to expand it to more like nonfiction piece. As far as 
you, you hit on a real interesting topic that I've, I've been thinking about lately. And as far as a prose writer, have you found that writing poetry makes you more word conscious as far as writing prose from taking it from verse? Absolutely. I mean, there's a different element you're trying to capture when you're telling a story versus when you're capturing an image. But poetry certainly informs prose in that you want to make the language beautiful. At least I do. Try to make it a picture in the reader's mind. So it certainly helps. And, honey, I can't think of any better way to exemplify that than to have you read some of your work. Okay. These pieces were recent, we, re, excuse me, recently in Wish, Walking a Still Honest Press, on March 10th, 2017. And this is called, At the Edge of the Middle Class Are Two People in Love. We take Thursdays off to be together, our sanctuary away from retail toil. It's 24 hours we give, our highest worship paid to each other. We have left our 20s well behind and do more adult modes of fun now. But these years have sped by with him by my side and how lonely without him that decade would have been. We have in our kitchen a pile of middle-class luxury, food and beverages seemingly decadent because we bought them with our own money. Coffee, grapes, tortilla chips, sugar cookies, we go out for the day to seek pleasure in shopping, as we figure money spent on books is no waste. Coming back from the bookstore, we stop for lunch at a sports bar, not for the sports, but for hot wings and cold beer. What game we delight in is good food, good drink, good company. Lately, deaths in my family have weighed me down. I will away grief, not to mar golden moments with my man. We are clay bound for dust. Our souls are sunset red reflections in a puddle, crimson leaves floating on top. Ornamental grasses with fuzzy seed pod tops are planted as landscaping outside the bar. I am speaking absently of past lives, of future reincarnations, and he stops me with a gentle hand on the shoulder. His fingers pull a bristly bit of fluff from my hair, he tells me he wants to come back as the grasses with fuzzy tips so he can get caught in my hair. And we laugh, our laughter as light as a blue balloon escaping a birthday party. And this is called Heart Full of Rain and Tears. Two days after we bury my grandmother, I find moonshine, apple pie, in my glass at the family reunion in the Pennsylvania hills, Thunderstorm moves in, a black cloud loaded down with rain. Wind blows the tent while we wait out the fury. Listening to the thunder, a smile finds my mouth as I utter. With drunk's logic, mourner's logic, Grandma finally decided to go bowling. I'm remembering that ad campaign from the 80s when, as a small child, where they urge, small, they urge people to give up smoking and go bowling instead. Tears are not far from the surface. Or the laughter bubbles, miniature rain in a miniature storm cloud, my heart. And this is called Three Dollar Dream. Three Dollar Western Romance. Smells like the dollar store where I bought it. Like detergent and clean cotton air freshener. Cashier, as she's checking me out, remarked, she liked that kind of book too. When I told her I'd like to try to write a book like this, she looked at me as if I've shared over much. Her look expressed without saying, how dare you have dreams, customer of cheap goods? People always appreciate others in our society as consumers of goods, but grow suspicious of the rare visionary who wants to create, as if everything should roll off the factory floor without human hands ever interfering. Kit Kats, tea light candles, dish soap, paperback romance. Thank you. Honey, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for being a part of this show. And y'all, seriously, I can't say it enough. Go check out Honey's Bible. Find her on Facebook and look for look her up on our website, www.southerncollectiveexperience.com. Honey, I cannot, just, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for having me. And without a stop, let's forge ahead with Mr. Dusty Huggins, who is the man in charge of the band Ides of June and one of the newest members of the Southern Collective Experience. Dusty, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks to NPR for having us over. WTC, so glad to be here. Man, it's 
you were you were a light in the woods, man. I'm serious. Tell us about what it's like being a part of the Southern Collective experience since you joined up. Uh, getting getting into the collective was a crazy experience because I just posted one of my songs on Facebook and another member ended up sharing it, my guitarist's um, cousin. And then you shared it, or you were like, "Man, this is awesome!" And I was like. Looked you up and it was like Ben Harper's the truth, or you know, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I love this dude. So we just started messaging back and forth, and then um, was like, Hey, you should come. Let's talk about being in the collective. I was sweet. Let's do it, man. Sounds interesting. And that ended up in a car crash and you getting lost in the woods somewhere. Yes. So we're like, Hey, maybe we'll pause this. So against all odds, we finally met at Applebee's like a month later, and just talking. It was just like talking to a brother. I'd had never met before incredible experience and just all the loving artists and um creative minds and everybody's so modest and humble it's it's really been an awesome experience and good to you are as a musician you get to hang out with all your musician friends but now you get to hang i get to be sophisticated and hang out with poets and novelists and sweet moving up in the world it has officially gotten deep in this booth <laughs> but to, just to put a pin in it every one of the details about our attempt the journey the epic to meet did indeed involve a car crash getting lost in the woods and i want to say one of us was kidnapped where our parent had to go get us like and taken but i'm i'm not gonna i'm not gonna quote that here on the air just yet i don't think they're ready for it no no maybe next time maybe next time in july but to scoop back around on you man um once you became a member of the the southern collective experience and then we moved towards things that you might want to spread out to things that you haven't really uh wet your uh put your feet in yet um it seemed natural for you to evolve into the music editor of the Blue Mountain Review. How's it been since you've uh, started working that slot? It's been amazing. I, I think that um, people under, well, maybe not, but writing and um, music go so hand in hand. And writing's something I do. We've actually got another singer named Alex Gannon and, and writer that writes now. But our first album, I wrote all of it, and it was so therapeutic and poetic and um, just liberating so getting to do combined writing, um, like in the magazine, Blue Mountain Review, um, scheduling, planning, talking with you, like, where do you want to go with this? Where should we go? I've got a foot in the music community, and it's just an overall um, incredible experience to be able to uh, combine two of my passions in one. And I think I've spent the last two weeks working diligently at writing some things coming out in the Blue Mountain Review, and it's been an escape from music, which is it's always good to get um, – artistic and creative outside of your comfort zone because it makes you dig deeper. So it's been an awesome experience. Really looking forward to the future. Um, you know, you pretty much give me creative, creative freedom to do whatever. So we've, we've interviewed two um, awesome front women out of Atlanta, Hannah Zell and Zell and uh, Miss Chelsea Shag that we're going to have in the next uh, magazine. So y'all check that out. Blue Mountain Review. Got some interviews in there. I think y'all dig them. And before I go any further, as I'm embarrassed to have done it before, the next issue, our spring issue of the Blue Mountain Review, will come out the first week of May 2017. And um, Dusty, you not only uh, interviewed bands, but you also had a personal piece in there. Um, what is it like to kind of um, stand naked as you were before a, a wider audience? Well, not in, couched in music. What's that like, literally? Um, it was uh, very... I mean, naked is a good term. You know, I sent it to you. I sent it to a couple of my friends. And, you know, telling it's pretty much my life story all the way up until um, maybe, you know, my first live show in music and just a reflection upon my life. And um, I think any individual comes to, you know, epic events, tragic events. And to leave any of those out is um, almost telling a lie. So doing that and just putting yourself completely out there. In music, you've got all these cool things going on in the background and different stuff, and then my singing style is pretty bluesy, so I don't, you know, half the time people don't understand it, but these are clear written words that everybody's going to understand, so I'm excited about it. I've, I've had a lot of help from, um, you know, you. I got a professor from Young Harris College to look over it, make sure, you know, it looks good, but uh, it, was, it was just invigorating, really. It was a lot of fun, and I look forward to y'all checking that out in the next... Uh, Blue Mountain Review as well. Man, I can't wait, dude. And seriously, I mean, to kind of scoot back around full circle, tell us about your band and where we can play. I hear uh, pretty soon you'll be playing here in Chattanooga. Yeah, we're super excited. We played Chattanooga back in February. Uh, we have quite a few friends here. This is um, the place we come to get away from Atlanta. It's just um, 
It's definitely not a small town because I'm from Blairsville, Georgia, but it's a lot more homey and, uh, you know, people are artsy and creative and you go hiking. There's mountains here. So we come here anytime we can, but we're playing um, May 12th with my good friend's band, uh, Heathen Sons from Nashville at Clyde's on Main. We're really stoked about that. Uh, released our first album, Exist, last year. Um, working on some new material for that. And really just excited to be um, coming here. We'll be headed to Atlanta. We're all over the place. Ides of June. Y'all check us out, man. Dusty, you, dude, you make this job easy, brother. And, uh, again, I cannot thank you enough for being here. And, y'all, again, he's on our website, www.southerncollectiveexperience.com. And he's got his own Facebook pages, and so does his band. And, again, he's got his own Twitter and Instagram under his name and the band. So, please, don't forget Ides of June. And make sure, if you're in the area, to check his out. Thanks so much for having me, guys. All right, man. And on our last leg of this circus, and I'm not trying to pick my favorites, but Mr. Peter Restuccia, I've probably known longer than anyone that's been on the show thus far, and he was a friend of mine before my first book came out. In fact, did one of the um, first uncomfortably thorough uh, interviews about the book in my life that really hit the, the nail on the head, and one of which I've remembered since. And from that friendship, um, you came in really with the Southern Collective experience from you know from Jump Street. So. How have you seen the Southern Collective experience change and, and how you like how you enjoy your part in it? Well, um, Cliff, thank you for having me here, first of all. And I'd like to say, taking a look from the beginning, perhaps the best way to discuss my view of the Southern Collective is from its seed idea that you and I had come up with. Uh -huh. where We talked about how uh, most cultural movements are uh, led by a consortium of different people from different venues of writers and artists and musicians, folks of like mind band together for uh, collective support and um, motivation perhaps. So I've watched it grow from that seed into something much bigger, and more complex, but in a good way. Uh, many different voices that have maybe come and gone, come back around again, and the various and sundry things that they've done been incredibly impressive, actually, if I may say so. Cool. And and you've um, had poems pr published in the Blue Mountain Review, but what really took me aback was your piece on faith. You know, in each issue at the end, we have a Faces of Faith, Voices of Faith, of those who meant a, a great deal to us in our spiritual journey. Tell us a little bit about the piece that you wrote for the magazine. Well, Cliff, um, I feel like sometimes, you know, again, things come full circle, um, maybe looking back to uh, the late 19th century, it might have been controversial or uh, striking new ground to question um, well-established traditions about faith at that time. But at, over the course of the 20th century and going into the 21st century, I found that there's been so much deconstruction taking place, there was nothing left to really deconstruct anymore. <laughs> And that more and more people were just really, they weren't deconstructing anything at all. They were just imitating our forebears from earlier time periods, and their work wasn't necessarily new or exciting. It certainly wasn't bold. And it fell to me that, that perhaps the, 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 the greatest revolt I could have against the modern world was to assert myself into a position of faith. The most rebellious thing I could say was that I, I did believe in something in this relativistic world that we live in, that there are universal truths, that there are eternal truths. Outstanding, like I said. And you can find that, and if you go back again and read the, the Blue Mountain Review, it's not something I'm trying to fluff out there to si simply promote the group, but the, the magazine is 99% the rest of the world, with a very small bit of it being uh, the flavor of the, the Southern Collective experience. And if you go from the first issue to the, the most common or the most current, you can literally watch us change. We never thought to go back and fix anything because we wanted people to see us develop as a group. And as developing as a group, we've spoken about these smaller known literary and art, artist groups that, you know, out of France. That, speak a little bit about those that have, that have moved you and given you some great ideas about us. Certainly. Um, well, again, looking back to uh, uh, influences that have preceded our own, I, uh, of course, looked at... Um, uh, consortiums of, of intellectual and artistic talent from other countries and other time periods. But, you know, there's always a tendency to go back uh, 
further back maybe than, than we have to. And there were movements that I could draw on that were closer to us in time, and consequently their experiences were more familiar, but in a good way to our own. Uh-huh. I looked at Manifeste Electrique, it's a literary poetic movement in France in the 1970s. Uh-huh. And then in turn, um, a, a group that drew from their influence called Infrarealismo, which is a Latino literary movement uh, from the late 20th, early 21st century, and to the best of my knowledge, is actually still an ongoing uh, movement. And of course, the, the influence of Latin literature um, the last half of the 20th century, it just can't be overstated, really. Fantastic. And to bring it back home, what have you been working on lately? What projects do you have on the horizon? Right now, I'm currently working on a, a variety of different prose and poetry books, as well as a, a work that's part historical drama, part historical fiction that takes place during the, the Counter-Reformation period. And it's about the lives of artists in Rome and the lives that they led at that time period. And that's really modern art actually can trace its origins to the efforts of Counter-Reformation artists who were commissioned by Rome to produce great works of, uh, of uh, spiritual faith. Right on, man. And I'm thrilled to death to have you here today, again, to read one of your fables. It's been a while since we've had you on the show, and you brought us a <laughs> brand new one. I so did. please prove to folks how much they need to be checking out Peter Restuccia. Okay. Well, this one I wrote uh, with the current political situation uh, in mind, something that I'm sure has alarmed me and perhaps many, many other people, I think. Um, the best fables uh, are timeless because they're always timely somehow. <laughs> and so I've written this one, uh, taking some influence from, this is actually, this is called The Emperor's New Clothes, which is familiar to us today from Hans Christian Andersen, but he uh, originally got the tale from a book of uh, fables that were uh, popular in Spain in the 15th century. So this is The Emperor's New Clothes, a modern version. The emperor's new clothes were invisible to anyone who was incompetent or undeserving of office. Of course, when he paraded about the court and about the town, it was also obvious to anyone that, because his new clothes were invisible to everyone, he wore nothing at all. It was awkward at first, but soon the emperor's attire became a running joke. Everyone talked about it and had a good laugh. The emperor was vain and foolish, easily tricked by some con men posing as tailors into becoming something of a laughing stock. The emperor's new clothes, the emperor's new clothes, was a saying, a moralistic axiom. But while people laughed, the emperor had executions without trial. Voices of dissent were imprisoned. Unprovoked wars were declared. And, of course, heavier taxes were levied. One day, after a morning of issuing imperial edicts, the emperor clambered upon his throne. There was a slight chill in the chamber, and he gathered his ermine-trimmed, jewel-inlaid robes about himself and chuckled. The wondrous garments had worked better than expected. He was glad to have had the tailors assassinated, or they could make them for another. That is good. Every time you come on, it's good, man. I cannot thank you enough. And again, Peter Restuccia, he can be found on our website, www.southerncollectiveexperience.com, and also on Facebook, where, before I leave, please tell us a little bit about the, the series of, of artworks that you've become known for and, and, and what really puts you um, in, in the mindset to do that. Well, um, Cliff, what happened, it was sort of by accident, really. Uh, years ago, um, art, of course, is a, an art history is a passion of mine. I was just uh, posting works of art um, kind of almost at random, and something that I didn't expect or anticipate was the, uh, the avalanche of a response I got. I started to get a lot of uh, private messages and emails thanking me for, for posting artwork, 
Mm-hmm. And it came, became very clear to me that, that this was something people were hungry for. That they really needed um, maybe some beauty in their lives. And so uh, I started to post artwork consistently. I would have people tell me they look forward to my art every day. So some of the, um, uh, perhaps not explicitly stated, but self-understood rules about it was that I, while I might post artwork that was by a famous artist, it wouldn't be necessarily art that was already you know well-known or out there that everybody recognized. I mean, everybody's seen Starry Night, everybody's seen The Scream or The Persistence of Memory or Christina's World or whatnot. But what maybe they haven't seen are Van Gogh's... Um, uh, more more overtly uh, Japanese woodblock influenced artworks, or maybe they haven't seen Edward Monk's uh, portraits of his father at dinner, or perhaps they've not observed um, uh, uh, Caravaggio's paintings of of the lives of the apostles, and uh, that sort of led me to where I am today, where I still consistently putting art out there, uh, you know, beauty for beauty's sake. It's an ugly enough world the way that it is. It doesn't need any more. And I have no better words to end this segment, Peter. Thank you so much for what you do and how blessed we are that you bring beauty to this world. Thank you so much for having me. All right. And as we end this show, I want to take it out with Loving You by the Tennessee Werewolf. Thank you enough for tuning in this evening. This is Clifford Brooks with the Southern Collective Experience. Let me remind you that my first book, Two Books in One, The Draw of Broken Eyes of Early Metaphysics, will be reissued the same time that the same press releases my second book, Athena Departs, Gospel of a Man Apart, through Backlash Press at the end of May 2017. The first week of May 2017, look forward to the spring issue of the Blue Mountain Review, and my heartfelt gratitude goes out to all the brothers and sisters that came in here today to tell you a little bit about us and them. We hope we did, as Peter Restucci said, brought a little bit of beauty to your world. Good night, y'all.